Thank you for the pleasure of being here with you, and it's, it's been fun because I've, got, I've had the privilege of meeting some people that I haven't seen for more than 50 years. Uh, actually, someone I went to grade school with, and she's a member of one of the churches here in this area. And uh, she's right back there. Her name is Esther. She said, do I remember Esther? And when she told me, I said, well, you got to tell me what your whole name was. And she told me her whole name. And I said, of course I remember you. And so that was probably like 60 years ago. So we went to the same elementary school in Stockton. And there was another gentleman who she, I mean, a gentleman who she brought over who also was in my hometown when I was a child many, many years ago. Didn't remember him so well, but uh, he said his mother happened to be a patient of my father. And uh, so it's always interesting to meet people from, from our childhood, because I've always wondered what has happened to some of them. There's only a couple kids that I went to elementary school that I know of and where they are. I remember the names of the others, but I have really no idea where they went or what happened to them. But there's a couple that I know. So thank you for the privilege of being here. And before we go any further, I invite you, even though you just prayed, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me for prayer again. Lord, it's been a wonderful experience here to meet with some of your most special friends and to have the privilege of visiting with them, of talking to them, of learning with them, and experiencing some of their joys and their sorrows, and learning how we can have a closer walk with you. We're grateful for your patience and your love, for your understanding and for your wisdom. And again, we beseech and ask you for more wisdom this, ap- this evening as we draw the Sabbath to a close and as we reflect and learn a few more things that we can do to enjoy life to its fullest. Please send your Holy Spirit. May he be here. May we be instruments in your hands to do your will, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you want to get hold of us, that's how to get hold of us. And if you don't have something to write down, uh, you can ask me for a card. I've got lots of cards but my home phone number is not on the card. So that's how to contact us in the future. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about diabetes. Diabetes is a larger and larger problem. It's probably one of the things along with heart disease and cancer that we see lots of in our programs, probably anywhere from... Um, 10 to 25, and sometimes even as high as 50% of the people in our programs have diabetes. And it it affects about 8% of our population here in the U.S. Uh, The current number for people with diabetes is somewhere between 23.5 and and 24 million people who have diabetes, so it's significant. So what is it, the difference between type 1 and type 2? How does lifestyle relate to this? And I've been intimating that all the time. Risk factors you may not be aware of, but we'll mention those briefly. And talk about some of these other things as well. Insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, nutrition, exercise, and so on. Well, what are the predisposing factors to diabetes? Well, the more, most common ones are the ones that we readily, you already know, are age and weight. The older you are and the heavier you are, especially if your weight is more than it should be, are risk factors. If you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or high triglycerides, those are additional risk factors. And, you know, it's really not so much that they themselves are the risk factors, but the lifestyle that leads to high cholesterol, high blood pressure and uh, high triglycerides is the same lifestyle that's going to help you acquire diabetes as well as, you know, obesity. Now, I don't know why ladies have more diabetes than men, but that's the way it is. If you don't exercise, you're at higher risk. 
If ladies have diabetes during pregnancy, they're at higher risk. Or if a lady had a baby that weighed more than 10 pounds at birth, the birth weight of a baby was one of your children was 10 pounds. And also a family history. First degree relatives, father, mother, brother, or sister with type 2 diabetes. Not type 1, but type 2 diabetes. And that's the more common kind usually called adult onset diabetes. And I'm sure that there's some members in your, here, some individuals here tonight who have diabetes. And then we look at ethnicity. Anyone who's non-Caucasian is at higher risk. Asians, Hispanics, blacks are all at higher risk than the Caucasian. Don't know why, Pacific Islanders, I'm going to be in one of the Pacific Islands in about, let's see, yeah, three weeks from now, I'll be on the island of Chuk. It used to be called Truk. It's part of Micronesia. And I'll be out there with one of my sons where we'll be doing some um, work for the people there. He'll be doing operating. He'll be operating on their eyes, and I'll be doing the follow-up and other things like that. So Pacific Islanders are at higher risk. And... In those areas, like in Micronesia, the Marshall Islands where we used to work, lots of people there have diabetes. And part of it is because of their diet. Their diet, instead of fish and breadfruit, which is what it used to be, now is white rice and sugar and, you know, and chicken and other things. You know, before it used to be breadfruit and fish, but now it's changed. Okay, pre-diabetes. Anyone who's over the age of 40 should have your blood sugar checked at least once a year to find out what it is. Fasting blood sugar would be fine. Normal fasting blood sugar goes up to 99, from usually around 60 up to 99, and that's in milligrams per deciliter. And if it's between 100 and 125, you're considered pre-diabetic which means you have a 15 times higher risk of developing diabetes. Your non-fasting blood sugar, if it's anything from 140 up to 199, that's considered the same pre-diabetic pre as well. Fasting blood sugar is usually what is taken in the morning before you eat, assuming you haven't had anything to eat from uh, the night before. You want to be fasting you know, 10 to 12 hours. No food, water's okay but no food, no crackers, you know, fruit or anything like that for the intervening 10 to 12 hours before your blood is taken. So if it's above those levels, or it's in these areas right here, we say it is, you are pre-diabetic, which means you have a 15 times higher risk of developing diabetes. And you really don't want to be there because diabetes is not a disease that is a nice disease, you know, then not too nice way of saying it. It's kind of like a slow death. Uh, and unless you learn how to manage it and take care of it, you know, you just kind of, um, things are going to um, not do so well. You're going to have more complications. Well, the most common complication of diabetes is some form of heart disease. So that we recognize. So... The sad news or the bad news is in the United States, we're going to get twice as many di people with diabetes in the next uh, 25 years. So from now, with almost 24 million, by, uh, you know, if the Lord hasn't come <coughs> by 2035, we expect to have like probably about 48 million Americans with diabetes. And unless we change things, I'm certain that's going to be true because as we look at that over the past 10 to 15 years, more and more Americans being overweight, and as rapidly as the weight goes up, all these other diseases are going to increase as well. So we might say this is creating a perfect storm. Aging population, all the baby boomers now that were born right after the Second World War coming on, and uh, families are smaller which means there's less people to pay for their social security and your social security in the future. and All kinds of things are happening. And the other thing about diabetes, it's an expensive disease. 
If you have the disease, health care costs may be four to five times that of a person without diabetes. So that's something we need to be concerned about as well. So 57 million Americans with prediabetes, the blood sugars, like we said, in those areas. <clears throat> and the thing that kind of distresses me, well, 40% of them are between the ages of 40 and 70, but 92% of these people could avoid the diabetes if they would just change their lifestyle. If they're overweight, lose weight. If you're not exercising, start exercising. And especially if they would go to a plant-based diet. No meat, no fish, no chicken, no eggs, no dairy. That would do marvelous things for our health care costs here in the United States. I know that's kind of hard to promote and it may not you know, be popular. And I'm sure that the dairy people and the, you know, the cattlemen and the poultry producers would not be in favor of that, but it would save tons of money. And that's, that's just a fact. Sixth leading cause of death in the U.S., 3.8 million deaths worldwide, and that's more than die from malaria and HIV infection combined. So that's not too good. And as we said, 24 million here with diabetes, but the next one that you see, 25%, one out of every four people age 60 and above has diabetes. One out of four. Well, two-thirds of adult Americans are overweight, so that goes along with that. So this is what we're seeing. And it's an expensive problem. So how many new cases every year? 1.6 million every year, 4,381 every day. That's 183 every hour, and that's about three every minute. So if we are here for an hour, that means in that hour, 183 new people with diabetes. Now, out of the 24 million who have diabetes, one-third, 8 million don't even know they have it. It hasn't been diagnosed yet. Diabetes is not a disease that appears Suddenly, in other words, everything is going along fine, blood sugars are normal, and uh, the next day your blood sugars are real high. It's a slow, gradual process, as we're going to see. It's the leading cause of end-stage renal disease, people having to go on dialysis or having to have kidney transplants here in the U.S. And if we could diagnose the diabetes earlier and get the people to manage their diabetes earlier, and take good care so the blood sugars aren't high, we could save lots of money. Now, the th interesting thing is people being what they are, when they get diagnosed with diabetes, some of the people say, I'm just going to pretend like I don't have it, I'm not going to do anything. You know, it's like an ostrich, he puts his head in the sand, doesn't want to know what's happening. But does that prevent the effects and the complications? Of course it doesn't. So if your blood sugar is not kept down to a safe level, all these complications of heart disease, of kidney disease, of eye problems just, you know, continue and they get worse much faster. People with diabetes more likely to have a heart attack or stroke, more likely to develop dementia. Dementia is the medical word for memory loss, you know, so it doesn't sound, you know, we say memory loss, but, you know, dementia, same thing. You know, there's three sure signs that you're maturing. That's a nice way of saying getting old, okay? One is you have more aches and pains, okay? The other one is your memory is not as good, and uh, I can't remember what the third one is. <laughs> now, if you have high blood pressure, you get your blood pressure down, uh, your diseases won't be as so bad, so that's important. Someone asked me, well, how about control of blood pressure? Well, if you're doing all the things that we've told you, you're down to your ideal weight, you're on a total uh, plant-based diet and you're exercising regularly and your blood pressure is still too high, in the level that I say, if it's consistently, the top number is 140 or higher, uh, and the bottom number is over 90, then I say, you've got to bite the bullet and take some medicine. So, because we want to prevent the complications of prolonged uh, high, blood, high blood pressure. Okay, non-traumatic amputations of the feet caused by diabetes. 
poor circulation to the feet, they end up having to have their feet amputated. Not their feet, but it's actually the leg below the knee, BK, below knee amputation. And what happens is usually the toes will get sores or they'll get black or they'll get sores on the feet. That's from gangrene. Well, then you say, why don't you just cut off the toe? Well, you can, but the circulation is so poor that it will not heal up. So to get to where the circulation is good enough for this wound stump to heal up, they do it just below the knee, BK amputation. And the worst foot that I've ever seen has been a patient that I saw in the Marshall Islands in Madrill. And this man's foot was so bad I could see through his foot. The flesh was missing. The surgeon wanted to remove his leg, but the man would not let him. I really don't know what happened to him. Well, basically, diabetes is an inability of the body to process cereal grains, fruits, in root vegetables or carbohydrates. That's what the problem is. And it's basically because of two things. One is the body doesn't produce enough insulin. The insulin is produced by an organ called the pancreas. A certain part of the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans and certain cells in the pancreas called the beta cells. They're supposed to produce the insulin. If that's been damaged some way by physical trauma, by some sort of infection, that would produce diabetes. And then the other change is on the cells and the cells, the cellular level. And that is because of something which we term insulin resistance. Now, what has to happen when you eat like the bread which you just had or the popcorn or the crackers or the potatoes, you know, any form of carbohydrate, the fruit, that's broken down by the body and it's digested and that becomes then little molecules of glucose. When we measure your blood sugar, we are measuring your blood glucose. And the glucose for our body to use it, it's got to get inside the cell. Glucose is the gasoline you know, that you need in an engine. Well, for our engine, the cells are the engine. We need to get the glucose inside the cell. And the only way it can get inside the cell is you have to have insulin present, and you've got to have receptors. Well, the easiest way to explain to you what a receptor is like is to explain it to you like receptors will say this room represents a big a cell. And the receptors then would be the doors. So if the doors are open, the receptors are active. If the doors are closed, the receptors are blocked or there is resistance. Not only do you need to have the receptors active, but you have to have insulin present. The insulin would then be like someone who is standing at the door, Dr. Schnell, he would be the greeter, and he would welcome you to come into the room. So if we would represent molecules of glucose, you know, inside we would then be, when you're inside the cell, you become it becomes glycogen. So the glucose has to get from the outside of the cell into the cell and only can come through the receptors. So if there's insulin resistance, it's not going to happen. Now, for a little while, the body can produce more insulin and just kind of force their way in, force the, force the glucose in. And that's, you know, can happen for a little while. Now, if the blood sugars are high, you develop cataracts sooner, which makes me as an ophthalmologist happy because I enjoy doing surgery. When I don't have surgery to do, you know, when I was doing surgery, I'd say my fingers are getting itchy. I would tell my nurse that, and I would hope and hope that I would get some cataract surgery to do. And usually the Lord was good, because there's people who have to have it done, and he'd send me a few, and I'd get to do the surgery. So that would take care of the itch. Now, I didn't get the money from this. This went to the hospital, because I've been most of my career, we've worked as missionaries. So I'm working for our church in one place or another. So you get cataracts sooner, you get changes in the eye sooner, diabetic retinopathy, changes in the kidneys, and all of these are not good changes. These are things that you want to avoid. Also changes in the circulation. Macrocirculation, that's the larger vessels, and microcirculation, the smaller blood vessels. The blood vessels in the heart, the blood vessels in the extremities, that's why you know, the circulation is bad, that's why they get gangrene in the toes. That's also why people with diabetes get peripheral neuropathy. 
the microcirculation to the nerves is not good, so they get burning, numbness, and tingling of their extremities. Diabetes is the most common cause of a condition we call peripheral neuropathy. Well, we've talked about the inadequate production of insulin. That's one of the defects, and the other one we've already talked about now is the insulin resistance in the target tissues. Well, how does it get started? How long does it take diabetes to develop? Somewhere between five and seven, five to ten years, average is about six or seven. And the way it first starts is there's insulin resistance because if you're overweight, the doors are going to be closed, insulin resistance. If you don't exercise, the doors are going to be closed, insulin resistance. If you eat the standard American diet of meat, fish, chicken, and fast food and high fat, the doors are going to be closed, insulin resistance. See, 90% to 95% of the people who develop diabetes have greater or lesser degrees of insulin resistance. So how can you get rid of that insulin resistance? Exercise is one way to open the doors. Eating a plant-based diet is another way to open the doors. Eating a low-fat diet is another way to get those doors open. All of the things we've been talking to you about for these past uh, 24 hours. So as it starts out then, blood sugar before eating, fasting blood sugar will be normal, 99 or less. Even the after eating, postprandial blood sugar will be normal. That has to be 140, I mean 139 or less. But in time, what happens is then the second stage here, number two, increased insulin resistance. That means now the before eating blood sugar is fine, but now the after eating blood sugar goes above 139. It's 140, somewhere between 140 and 199. And you want to measure this two hours from the time you start to eat. And that starts to go up till eventually it gets to be 200 or more. And that's when you have you're no longer pre-diabetic, you have diabetes. So some of you go see the doctors and they say, well, you don't have diabetes yet. No, no they just say, you're pre-diabetic. You don't want to be pre-diabetic. If you are pre-diabetic, you need to do some of the things we've talked about. So stage number two, after eating blood sugar, now is above 140. Stage number three, and this is usually where it's diagnosed, and this is you know six, seven years downstream, that's when your before eating blood sugar is now 126 or higher, or your after eating blood sugar is 200 or higher. That's when we diagnose the disease. So it's a slow, gradual process, okay? Now the other thing is as you mature, <laughs> that's a nice way of saying aging, your receptors get less active. I mean, the receptors, you know, there's more resistance and the doors are closed. So you've got to do all these certain things to keep them open, like exercise, like eating a plant-based diet, like eating a lower-fat diet. See? That helps to get those doors open. And this was a study that showed that short-term exercise, like we're going for a walk, would help to open those doors. Okay? So that's really important. And not only does the exercise open the doors, decreases the insulin resistance, but it stimulates the production of the insulin by the beta cells. And, you know, so there's the reference. Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, volume 93, pages 387 to 392, 2008. Short-term exercise improved insulin resistance and significantly increased beta cell function in older people with um, impaired glucose tolerance. That means your after eating blood sugars are too high. And the hemoglobin A1C is something that we measure in people to see what their blood sugar has been like for the previous three months. Some people with diabetes don't like to check their blood sugars. You know, they've got very wonderful device. So all you've got to do is stick your finger and put a drop of blood on the thing and you can find out what your blood sugar is. And that really helps us to manage the people with diabetes a lot better. But some people don't like to stick their fingers, and it costs about 75 cents to a dollar every time you do the test. Well, so we can measure what your blood sugar's been like for the past three months by 
doing a blood test called the hemoglobin A1C. Normal, person without diabetes, 5.9% or less. If a person has diabetes, we're satisfied if it's 6.9% or less. So seven and above is not good. If you don't have diabetes, six and above is not good. And the higher that number is, the higher your risk of heart disease. The other thing is if you have diabetes, you're going to have more problems with your memory. Just remember, anything which slows down your circulation is going to diminish your health. Anything which improves your circulation is going to enhance or improve your health. So what are things that will improve your circulation? Exercise, low-fat diet, preferably a low-fat plant-based diet, see? And uh, not a high-sugar diet, because we can say sugar comes from plants, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But I want to be complex carbohydrates, not the refined carbohydrates. All the things you've been talking about will help to lower your risk for developing diabetes and lower your risk for memory loss. Another good thing about counteracting memory loss, and I had a patient tell me, she even called me up or wrote to me, and she came to see us at Weimar several years ago, and she said she was having trouble remembering things. So, and she told me, she said, you told me to go out and start memorizing Bible text. And she said, I did. He says, you know what? It works. It makes a difference. There's nothing that will stimulate your mind as much as trying to memorize text in the Bible. But you say, I can't do it. You can't do it if you won't do it. Don't tell me you can't remember Jesus wept, pray without ceasing, rejoice every more. <laughs> those are very short texts. And once you get those, you can do others. See, the mind is like a muscle, and if you use it, you won't lose it. And so that's true. You've got to use it or lose it. Well, how about meat? Well, here's another study published in 2009. It says, what in essence, what it says is the more meat you eat here, red meat, higher risk of developing diabetes. Very clear. The evidence is there. Frequent consumption of bacon, hot dogs, and sausage, those are what we consider processed meats, increases your risk of developing diabetes. So if you like hot dogs and stuff, you know, and salami and pastrami and corned beef, uh, higher risk of developing diabetes as well as heart disease and cancer and all these other things that you really don't want. So plant-based Diet is really the way you want to go. So anything that's going to lower your risk for heart disease, usually, you know, as far as diet goes and exercise, is likewise going to lower your risk for developing diabetes, and that's good. Low-fat, plant-based diet reduces body weight. Well, if you get, if you weigh less, you immediately lower your risk for developing diabetes. If you eat a plant-based diet and not eating meat, you lower your risk for getting diabetes. And if you have diabetes, it's going to make it easier to control your blood sugar. Because every time someone eats meat, fish, or chicken, what does it do to the insulin receptors? It develops insulin resistance, which means it closes the doors. Very simple. Diets high in animal protein, that's meat, are associated with an increased risk of diabetes. High total in animal protein intake but not vegetable protein intake is associated with a higher risk for diabetes. Pretty clear. And that was in Diabetes Care 2010. That was just published this year. Now, this is looking at ladies who ate processed meats, you know, the sausages and hot dogs and things. 1.9 times higher for those who consume meat five times or more a week compared to those who ate the processed meat less than once a week. I'd say the evidence is pretty strong right there. It is well established that the prevalence of shortness, obesity, is low in people who do not eat meat. We've already showed you this, I think, last night. That was Dr. Fraser's uh, study. And again, lifestyle intervention, exercise, plant-based diet, works just as good as in controlling the blood sugar in people who have a poorly controlled uh, diabetes. 
I just talked with a lady last night. I went after I went home. I called one of my patients at Weimar, and before she came to Weimar, she was taking anywhere from 200 to 400 units of insulin a day. That's a lot of insulin. She was taking something called 70-30 insulin, anywhere from about 70 or 80 units, three times a day with the meals, plus a short-acting insulin. And so we were trying to help her out. And we were also rapidly cutting down on her insulin because with the change in diet, she didn't need as much insulin. And she was doing much better. In fact, she had, she had cut down her insulin intake from the 70-30, which I really don't like to use in patients, but they come here using that, and some, it's hard to change them. She would cut down to 20 units from you know, 85 to 90 units per three times a day. So again, getting your weight down helps. 80% of those with diabetes are overweight. Convincing evidence that we could prevent diabetes if we could keep people from getting overweight. And also shifting them to a plant-based diet. So that's one of the things that I've done for my own lifestyle and compared to my parents. Both of my parents were a little bit over. My father was more overweight than my mom. My mom was really pretty good until she probably got to be about 60. She was very fussy about how much she weighed. She was just a little bit heavy. My dad, he was only five feet eight, which is shorter than I am, and he weighed up to 200 pounds at one time. You know, he was strong and muscular and he exercised, but he was overweight. He developed type two diabetes, and my mom eventually did as well, along with high blood pressure. So does diet make a difference? Absolutely. <clears throat> so here was an interesting study done by one of my colleagues in preventive medicine, Dr. Serena Tonstead. And she divided, she took these patients and she looked at and she looked at their diets. Vegan diet, like we're advocating. Then there was a uh, lacto ovo vegetarian diet. That's, you know, plants plus eggs and dairy. Then a pesco vegetarian, plants plus eggs and dairy plus fish. And then the semi vegetarian, I guess, which now includes chicken and then the non-vegetarian, which includes meat, fish, chicken, and all of the above. And the body mass index is a ratio or a proportion between your height and weight. And a healthy one, BMI, needs to be 25 or less. That's really too generous. It really needs to be 23 or less. And, but you see, so the higher this number is, the heavier the people are. And so what we look at is then, here's those same diets again. These are the number of people then who have diabetes. So the higher the weight goes up, the more meat they eat, the higher the risk of developing diabetes is. This kind of a progressive relationship. And this was the reference for that paper. That was just published last year, Department of Preventive Medicine from Loma Linda University. And that's where I did my residency in preventive medicine. I know Serena, I know Dr. Fraser, and, and uh, some of these people who wrote this paper. Now, in Diabetes Educator, which is another medical journal. In 2004, our director of research, Dr. Beverly Henry, wrote a paper about how we at Weimar manage people with diabetes. And so here's what the papers showed. 317 people, 217 with diabetes, 94 with obesity. It was only a three-month follow-up, which is unfortunately too short. Two-thirds were ladies. But what we found out was that at the beginning of the study, the average blood sugar was 150. Three months later, it's now 120. That's the mean. That's the average for all the people. So now the mean is still impaired fasting glucose, but it's below the level of what's diagnostic for diabetes. Their cholesterol decreased 40 points. The weight came down 21 pounds. Their exercise time increased. In essence, what we showed was that 40% of those people with type 2 diabetes now had normal blood sugars without having to use any medicine. And of the 60% who had to use, still had to use medicine, they had better control of the diabetes, blood sugars were lower, with less medicine. So that's good. We can help prevent some of those complications. Well, what is the protocol that we use in managing our people who have diabetes? Well, here it is, nice and easy. 
Whole plant foods eaten whole. Have you ever heard that before? Okay. And just in case you don't really understand what it is, I put the second line in. No meat, no fish, no chicken, no eggs, and no dairy products. Because some places where I speak in the world, I just tell the first one, say, that's fine, doc, I don't eat any meat, I just eat fish and chicken. I said, that's meat. So I have the second line in, so there is no misunderstanding. And if you have diabetes, eat your salad and vegetables before you eat your carbohydrates, your bread, your pasta, your rice, or your potatoes. That fiber delays the absorption, so your sugars won't go up so fast. If you have legumes, beans, lentils, garbanzos, eat those, because those don't seem to raise your sugar. Eat slowly. That's right. They did a study where they had di people with diabetes eat fast, and then they had them eat slow. And when they eat fast, their blood sugars were higher. Don't eat between meals. That applies whether you have diabetes or not. Okay. And if you have diabetes, we tell them not to eat any fruit after breakfast and no dried food and no, preferably no juices. Because uh, dried food is not a whole plant food and neither is juice. See, what's been removed in the juice, in most juicers? The fiber, right. And in your dried fruit, what's been removed? The water, see. So that tends to make your sugars go up a little more rapidly. And you want to eat the carbohydrates, the complex carbohydrates like we talked about last night, but you really need to be careful with potatoes. The white potato raises the sugar a little bit faster than the ones that are red. And that's because the sugar, the starch granule in the potatoes is very small. So uh, sweet potatoes and yams don't tend to raise it quite as much. But you've got to be careful. You cannot use two or three servings of, you know, of your baked potatoes and your mashed potatoes and things like this if you have diabetes. And even brown rice, you don't want to eat a large serving of brown rice either and minimize the intake of deep fried oily and greasy foods, okay? And then as soon as you finish eating, go for a little walk, 15, 20 minutes. Well, why? As soon as you start to eat, what happens to your blood sugar? Where does it go? Up. As soon as you start to exercise, what happens to your blood sugar? It goes down. So it's not going to go so high. And it does make a difference. And of Everyone needs to exercise a total of an hour a day or however long it takes you to cover three miles and avoid your caffeine, soft drinks, and alcohol. And if you're going to be on a totally plant-based diet, which I hope you will, I want you to get used to taking B12 on a regular basis. Okay? Very simple. That's the protocol we use for people who have diabetes. And the goals that we want them to achieve before eating blood sugars, less than 110, two hours after eating, postprandial, measured from the time you start to eat, not the time you finished eating, okay? From the time you start to eat, two hours later, 139 or less. And that's good management. If it's 140 or higher, then you've got to look back at what you did that you need to improve on, okay? And your bedtime blood sugar, if you're on medicine to lower your blood sugar like insulin and other things, we'd like it to be um, at least 110 so you don't get too low in the evening. Elderly women with diabetes, more likely to develop dementia. So that's anything which impairs your circulation is going to increase your dementia. Now, this was a very important study done by the National Institute of Health, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you're in that pre-diabetic group, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, non-Caucasian, you know, over the age of 45, over the, overweight. But what can you do to lower your risk for getting diabetes? Exercise 150 minutes a week. That's 25 minutes six times a week or 30 minutes five times a week. My recommendation is really uh, 60 minutes four or five times a week. And if you need to lose weight, it needs to be 60 minutes six times a week. Lose, lose some weight and exercise. So if they lost 15 pounds and did that exercise, they were less than 60, they decreased their risk of di getting diabetes by 58%. If they were over 60, they lowered their risk for getting diabetes by 
remarkable. Very easy to do. And they didn't even ask you to do a plant-based diet. If we add that in as well, that would run those numbers up even higher. So that was a very important study published eight years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. So again, more weight, more diabetes. Uh, we need to go on. Nuts and peanut butter are better than meat. Metabolic syndrome. It's been just a few moments here. There are five things that we look at. Your weight, your triglycerides, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and your HDL cholesterol. If your numbers exceed any one of these, and you have, you're positive in three of those, you have what we call metabolic syndrome. Any three out of the five. So guys, if your waist is more than 40 inches, or ladies, if your waist is more than 35 inches, that's worth one point. And uh, the only one here you might not, HDL is, the first one is for guys, for males. If it's less than 40 and less than 50 for women, that's worth another point. So if you've got three points, you've got metabolic syndrome. If you've got four points, your risk is even higher, but you still have metabolic syndrome, which means your risk for developing diabetes is going to be about 15 to 20 times that of a person who doesn't have this problem. Smokers, more risk for diabetes as well. If you are more active, you lower your risk. Uh, let's see. And here was the scientific explanation of why when you eat meat, fish, and chicken, your blood sugars go up. This was a, written by one of my colleagues in preventive medicine, Dr. Stephen Pervantia. This article was published in the medical journal called uh, Medical Hypothesis. It is proposed that the consumption, the eating of meat, animal body tissue, activates the biochemistry of insulin resistance. So what happens to the doors when you eat meat? They're closed. See, so that means you need more insulin to get the blood sugars down. And if you stop eating meat, you won't have as much insulin resistance, so that means you will need less medicine to get your blood sugars down, or your blood sugars won't go up as high. Very clear. See, So the same thing happens if you're ill, you know, injury, illness, or starvation, more insulin resistance. And meat is injured tissue. And when you eat meat, it tends to raise your cholesterol, your blood pressure, and your triglycerides as well. So all other, other good reason to stop it. When you eat meat, more saturated fat, more insulin resistance. So I think we need to go on to the next section that I want to jump to. Any questions about diabetes before I go on? See, the complications I'm trying to prevent are heart disease, that's one. Uh, kidney disease, that's another. Eye disease, that's another one. And one which people don't like to talk about for guys is impotence. It's a very common uh, problem associated with both high blood pressure and associated with uh, diabetes, impotence. You know, that's pretty commonly described nowadays. You know, they have all kinds of sporting events which, which are promoted by the drugs which are available, Viagra and Cialis and all these other things for something called ED erectile dysfunction, which is the new term for impotence. Is there any symptoms such as if you eat something with sugar in it before you go to bed <coughs> at night, do you tend to have a sweet, uh, sugar-type taste in your mouth when you wake up? Talking about a person with diabetes or a person without diabetes? Well, there's nothing that I've read <clears throat> that talks about that, but if you're concerned about that, please get a fasting blood sugar and get a two-hour after-eating blood sugar, two-hour postprandial blood sugar. And if your fasting blood sugar is 99 or less, that's good. And if your after-eating blood sugar is uh, 139 or less, that's good. 
But if after eating your blood sugar is over 200, that just confirms that you have diabetes. So that's the most important thing for you to do. I really don't know about the taste. I haven't read anything. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there's certain characteristics of people who have diabetes. Usually they're overweight. And sometimes if they are very thirsty, drink lots of water. I didn't even mention that. Lots of water, frequent urination, hungry but losing weight. That goes along with uh, having diabetes. Also, here's another reason for not using caffeine. It makes your blood sugars higher. Okay, I need to... Not really, unless it causes diabetes. Okay, I'm going to shift to another area here, a little bit about exercise. Because if you want more energy, one of the things that you need to do to get more energy is to exercise on a regular basis. So we'll spend just a few minutes on that. Any other questions on diabetes? I want to. The other thing is, there is a handout which I can uh, give to the people here. It's about seven pages, which kind of summarizes the things we've talked about cancer warning signs and tests and things like that. Or if you want it, you can always email me and I can send it to you as an attached file if you have email. So, just a few minutes about exercise, why? Uh, so on, benefits. <laughs> I was going to wake up early to go jogging, but my toes voted against me 10 to 1. <laughs> Number one lesson, don't listen to your toes. Uh, your toes are not a reliable indication. You make a choice, you make a decision, and you do what you need to do because you need to do it. Okay, That's important. Dr. Walter Bortz, the second, said, there's no drug in current or prospective use. And he said this way back in 1982, which is 28 years ago. There's, they had no drug at that time. He did not think that they were going to find a drug in the future, and they haven't. Okay, That holds as much promise for sustained health as a lifetime program of regular exercise. You've got to exercise. If you want to live and be healthy, you've got to exercise. We were designed and created to live an active lifestyle. Adam and Eve had a garden to tend. You may not have a garden to tend if you do, do, but do it, take care of it. But you need to be active, you need to move. Plan structured repetitive bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that requires energy expenditure. Does walking fulfill that? Yeah. Does pruning trees, raking leaves, Hoeing, pulling weeds, does that fulfill that? Of course. Useful work is really the best exercise. The older I get, the faster I was. You know, we remember back when, you know. Like I remember when Esther was a little girl. She could run a lot faster than she could now, you know. That happens to all of us, okay. I don't know who's going to win, but... Uh, I have my ideas. <laughs> if you plan on being slothful, sedentary, you'd better have a thorough medical checkup to see if you're healthy enough. Am I implying that not exercising is dangerous to your health? Absolutely, unequivocally. It's true. And if you don't exercise, you're going to have a shorter lifespan. But you say, I don't have time to exercise. Well, let's explore that a little bit, okay? That's a sloth, by the way, and I don't want you to look like that. It moves so slowly, even though you can't see it, that's supposed to be green down there. Moss is growing on the back, you know. So I want you to move a little bit faster than that. The course description said gently rolling. Well, you don't have to exercise with an ice axe and all those other things. Just go out for a nice walk. That would be fine. Inactivity, slothfulness, sedentary. That's a fruitful cause or a common cause of disease. Exercise quickens and equalizes the circulation of the blood. Remember we said perfect health requires perfect circulation. I didn't say that. 
But in idleness, the blood does not circulate so freely, and the changes in the blood so necessary to life and health do not take place. What are those changes? Increased activity of the natural killer cells, lower blood sugars, lower blood pressure, lower triglycerides, lower cholesterol, better circulation. See, those are the changes that take place when you exercise. More people die for want of exercise than through over-fatigue. Very many more rust out than wear out. You know, if you don't use it, you get stiffer. You've got to stretch. You, know, you want to stretch after you exercise. And uh, the last one says, the time spent in exercise is not lost. Very interesting. Dr. Ralph Paffenbarger, a gentleman who's written multiple papers on exercise, probably 200 or more, he says for every hour you spend exercising, you will get that hour back plus 30 minutes. So don't give me the excuse that you don't have that time to exercise. You know, and we showed you this earlier. What fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? So if you ever think of not exercising, just remember that. If you're not willing to exercise, just plan on being dead because it's going to happen sooner than you think. In other words, in essence, if we were designed and created to be active, if you are active, you will live your normal lifestyle, which means for every hour you spend exercise, you're going to get 30 minutes back. If you don't exercise, your lifestyle is going, I mean, your life is going to be shortened. Is that pretty clear? Easy for you to understand? Have they made it easy? So you can understand a little exercise every day is better at relieving chest pain from angina or angina than having a stent put in. This one they used a bicycle. So how about osteoporosis? Ladies and older people are concerned about osteoporosis. You know, you don't want to fracture that hip. And, you know, you go get studies, DEXA scan and bone scans and other things like this to find out the density of your bones. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you'll walk, you'll have stronger bones. Ladies who walked one hour and nine minutes a day, that's eight hours a week, plus three minutes, eight hours and three minutes a week, because seven times nine is 63. So if you walk an hour... In nine minutes every day, you lower your risk for hip fracture by 55% compared to ladies who only walked or exercised nine minutes a day. So, and if you only did four hours a week, and that's about 35 minutes a day, 34 and a quarter minutes, if you want to be more precise, but say 35 minutes a day, you lower your risk for hip fracture by, what, 41% compared to those who only exercise nine minutes a day. <laughs> my doctor told me to start my exercise program very gradually. Today I drove past a store that sells sweatpants. <laughs> That's too gradually. <laughs> I want you to go ahead and get the equipment and start using it that day. Okay? Maybe I'll give you till tomorrow. Well, what are the benefits? Your heart rate goes slower. And that's good because when your heart beats slower, in between your heartbeats, that's the resting phase or when the heart is filling up with blood. That's when the muscle of the heart gets the blood during diastole. And that's when it gets the oxygen. Okay. Now, if you exercise regular, we already told you this, it increases your good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, Lowers the blood pressure, improves insulin sensitivity. What does it do to your doors, your receptors? Opens the doors. Your insulin works better. Also stimulates the production of insulin. Makes your blood so it's not as thick. Decreases your hematocrit. And, see, increases your bone density. Makes your bones stronger. Helps prevent or control diabetes. See, if you're at risk for getting diabetes, regular exercise will lower your risk by 48% in the graph that I uh, have. You may or may not see that. Helps to control obesity. Helps you to lose weight. It's really difficult to lose weight and keep it lost without exercise. You can, 
but you're going to be starving, it's much easier to combine it with exercise. And as my wife told you, says, uh, no food after three, and if you want to, um, three o'clock in the afternoon, and exercise, walk at least three miles a day, six times a week, and you will lose weight. Lowered risk for cancers, helps control anxiety and depression, that's right. Exercise is a great antidepressant as well as a great tranquilizer. Isn't the Lord marvelous? He designed this to be active, and being active both takes care of your anxiety and your depression and helps to control osteoarthritis. Helps you uh, to manage stress better, uh, less problem with fibromyalgia, and improves intermittent claudication and symptoms of Alzheimer's. Claudication is the pain that you get in the muscles when you don't have an adequate blood supply. So that means as you exercise regularly, your circulation is going to improve because we're assuming that the pain is caused by arteriosclerosis and a diminished blood supply. So the moment you go on a plant-based diet and you start to exercise, your vessels open up a little bit and you get more blood to your heart, to your brain, to all of your muscles. So 60 minutes of moderate activity such as uh, swimming, brisk walking, or jogging are the way to go. And you need to do that if you need to lose weight six times a week. If you don't need to lose weight, then you can get down to four or five times a week. You know, I, I just get a pedometer and, you know, I look at it and I try to get on here about three miles, at least four or five times a week. So far today, I'm up to 4.15. So while my wife is talking to you, I'm out walking around your neighborhood, looking at who your neighbors are, the vacant lots or what's for sale. or what. I'm just out walking. And even when I'm here in front of you, I'm pacing back and forth a little bit. So... You can get either measures in miles, meters, steps, whatever. You need to be active. And you need to be active throughout your whole life. 80 years old, who exercise, better cognitive abilities, better ability to focus and use their minds than people who didn't exercise. And they did better on test scores when they tested them as well. <clears throat> Lowered risk for uh, Alzheimer's and memory loss. People who exercised. Less problems with dementia. Oh, how fast do you have to walk to burn fat? Good study done by Arizona State University. Three miles an hour. 20 minutes per mile. That's not, you know, 20 minutes per mile is probably about like this. Most of you can do that. And you want to do it for longer periods of time. That will help you to burn the fat. So that's good. And let's see. Lack of exercise is as bad for you as if you smoked or had high blood pressure or had high cholesterol. The handle on your recliner does not qualify as an exercise machine. Physical inactivity, being slothful, <laughs> increases your risk of high blood pressure by one third and diabetes by one half. Regular physical activity on most days of the week will reduce your risk of dying from heart disease, high blood pressure, strokes, diabetes, and all that, all the things we've been talking about here. Doesn't need to be strenuous. Okay, how much time do you need to exercise? Very simple. Frequency. Most days of the week. So what's the minimum for most days of the week? Four. Four out of seven is most days. Very good. And if, but if you need to lose weight, you want to get it up to six. How much exercise, enough to get your heart rate up to 60% of your maximal heart rate, and we'll show you how to 
calculate this in just a moment. And time, however long it takes you to cover three miles. The faster you do it, the less time it takes. See? If you do your miles in six minutes running, you can get all your three miles in in 18 minutes. You have a warm up and a warm down. Okay. So here we take an example of someone who is uh, 50 years of age, 220 minus your age times 60%. So 220 minus 50 times 0.6 equals 102 beats per minute. If your exercise heart rate exceeds that number, then you're getting aerobic exercise. Okay? I'm going to make it real simple with the next one. So all you have to do is learn one number. Round off your age to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100. And then your heart rate has to exceed this number of beats. That's 15 or more for someone who's 70 years old to be getting aerobic exercise. If you're 90 years old, it would be 30 or more beats. I mean, excuse me, it would be 13. If you're 100 years old, it would be 12 or more beats for the 10-second count. So you round off your age. So from 36 to 45, you round it to 40. See, if it's 34, you go down to 30. If it's 35, you go down to 30. If it's 6, 7, 8, 9, you go up. If it's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, you go down. So it's very simple. All you've got to learn is one number. Okay? Any questions? Now, the other thing is some of you are on some medicine, so your heart rate won't go that fast. You're on something we call a beta blocker. That's okay. You're still getting benefits of exercise even though your heart rate doesn't go up. So don't worry about it. Just get out and do the exercise. Okay? That's important. <clears throat> And you don't have to do it all at one time. You can split it up. Ten minutes, six times a day. Six minutes, ten times a day. Three minutes, twenty times a day. Twenty minutes, three times a day. Thirty seconds, 120 times a day. No, that's kind of hard to figure that out, but you get the idea. You can split it up. Okay? And the other thing is build it into your activities. You know, When you go to Costco or Walmart or Target or go shopping over here in the mall, don't try to park real close to the store. Park further away and walk in. I haven't had a chance to walk around here and you look at the parking lot, but sometimes when you go to some of these parking lots, there's you know, a lot of cars parked right in front. If you park further away, you can find a parking place sooner. You get a little walk in, you get a little exercise, you know, and you walk around the store. So that all counts as part of your exercise. And also another fact you want to look at is your resting heart rate. When you wake up in the morning, check your pulse. What is your resting heart rate? If you don't have any heart disease, and your resting, the average resting heart rate is somewhere between 60 and 90 beats per minute. So that means if you count for 10 seconds, it's going to be anywhere from 10 to 15 beats for that 10-second count. But if you're healthier and you're more fit, often your resting pulse will go down lower. Instead of 60, it may go down to 55 or 50 or to 40, 45. If it gets below 40, then I become concerned unless you're a really good athlete who does lots of running, endurance-type training where you're riding a bicycle 20 and 30 miles a day. Because if you are more fit, your heart is stronger, you're stronger, so your heart doesn't have to beat as many times to pump out the same amount of blood because it pumps out more blood each time it beats. We say the stroke volume is increased or the cardiac output is increased. So, for example, if your heart can only pump uh, three ounces of blood with each beat, I'm just picking a number out, and when it gets stronger, it can pump out four ounces of blood with each beat, well, then it's not going to have to pump as many times to pump out the same amount of blood. You understand what I'm saying? So there's more blood put out with each beat, so it can pump at a slower rate. When I was running regularly, I'd run three miles, three, four, five times a week, and sometimes more on the weekends, 
my resting heart rate was in the high 30s, somewhere between 35 and 40. Now that I'm not running, I'm just walking, my heart rate's a little faster. It's usually, you know, between 45 and 50, sometimes above, but it's still slow. So if you stay fit, uh, your heart doesn't have to work as hard. These are medicines that slow your heart rate down. <clears throat> They're called beta blockers. And many of you who have heart disease or have high blood pressure may be on one of these types of medicines. Another thing about these medicines is some of them also make your triglyceride levels go higher. And let's see. Yeah. Don't complain that you can't park in the handicapped spot. You know, be glad that you're not handicapped. It's interesting as I meet many of my former classmates and others to look at their status of health. When I go to my medical class reunion and I look at my classmates, it's really easy to spot the ones who exercise regularly. They don't look like football players. <laughs> They're more trim. The ones who don't exercise regularly are usually heavier and overweight. And uh, I think you've noticed the same thing. Those of you who exercise more regularly have less problems with your weight than those who don't exercise regularly. <clears throat> Here's a part of the run where you fit in some speed work, pit bulls. You know, if you've got really nasty animals where you exercise, you might want to find a different route or a place to exercise. Or if you can't, you might want to carry a little can of pepper spray or something or stick. But you know, you can usually find a place where it's uh, safer. So don't challenge the animals. Less exercise, more heart disease. The natural killer cells we told you about when you exercise increases their activity, so less cancer. Mood is better. We've already talked about that. And in essence, as we're finishing up, these are different types of activities in which you will expend approximately 300 calories, and that's our goal for you, 300 calories a day. So volleyball, walking, raking, gardening, swimming, basketball, running, all of those activities expend about uh, 300 calories in the time given. Okay, I think we're finished with this section. Any questions now? been a production of Ceiling Time Ministries. For more programs like this and other exciting topics and speakers, you can visit our website at www.ceilingtime.com.